experts say scenes like this are a wake-up call. Climate change is wreaking havoc across the world, disrupting lives, economies and people's futures. This week, we'll look at how countries across Africa can prepare for, respond to and recover from natural disasters. Also, our reporting teams go to the heat of the fight against climate change in West East and Southern Africa, and meet the people on a mission to protect their land and livelihoods. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I'm Heidi Adams, thank you so much for joining me. The Horn of Africa is experiencing what's called the worst drought in decades. Experts say it's killing crops and cattle across the region in countries like Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia. They say it's all due to climate change. And in Gode, Ethiopia, people say they can see the changes in their daily lives. Linda Givtash visited the region for us and brings us the details. It's become an all too familiar sight in Ethiopia. Despite a last ditch effort to feed her cattle with grass from her thatch roof, Addis Ahmed Omar says they all perished. Her family is now among the 7.2 million Ethiopians who are not getting enough to eat, according to the United Nations. When I was young, drought came and we coped and survived with it. But this current drought is continuous and recurrent. It's more than we can manage. These events aren't just lasting longer, they're becoming more frequent. Some of the former pastoralists at this displacement camp lost their livestock in 2017. They've become permanent residents of the area, having abandoned their nomadic lifestyle to instead rear small animals like goats and grow produce. It is better to look for other livelihoods rather than pastoralism. Education and other livelihoods like farming. Mixed farming is another option. Climate change is projected to bring even more extreme conditions in the years to come with contrasting droughts and floods. That will also contribute to soil erosion and degradation, shrinking the available land for pasture. Within this year, experts say there's a 61% chance the region's next rainy season will fail, devastating even more pastoralists. It is very challenging for them to continue the same um, way of life depending on just natural resources. So the future is not, is not bright, unfortunately, to say. But that's where they need to adapt to the, to the new uh, climate condition. In the northern Afar region, pastoralists say they shouldn't have to abandon their tradition. Instead, they want more support from government for protecting grazing land and to develop programs to provide emergency feed and medication for livestock. Afar have this wealth of traditional knowledge, this wealth of what to do, when it's too dry, there's no water. There's wealth of how to look after their herd. But politics doesn't allow them. At a clinic 100 kilometers from Afar's capital of Samara, Biru Ali, a pastoralist mother, is not as optimistic. Surviving on just bread and rations of water trucked in by aid groups, she says her two-year-old is now sick with diarrhea. I don't want my daughter to do the same. Education. While many say they would welcome an alternative future for their children, now faced with hunger, their focus is on simply surviving today. Linda Giftash for VOA News, Gode, Ethiopia. Meanwhile, communities on South Africa's east coast are still picking up the pieces after one of the biggest natural disasters in that country's history. Days of heavy rain saw rivers burst their banks and mudslides sweep through the city of Durban. And those caught in the storm say they need better protection from this kind of extreme weather and that more is needed to help communities recover. Here again is Linda Givtash. It has been over a month since historic floods in South Africa's eastern province of KwaZulu-Natal made nearly 7,000 people homeless. But their numbers are growing as heavy rains and repeat floods hit the port city of Durban last weekend, destroying more homes and damaging this temporary shelter. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. So if it happens for the rain to come back again, so that means we won't have a, a shelter to accommodate, to accommodate other people because the, 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 the halls right now is overloaded. 
KwaZulu-Natal officials say at least 250 people were evacuated from shelters. South African federal authorities earmark $63 million for cleanup and rebuilding, while funds are also coming from various levels of government and aid groups. But victims say they haven't been told when they will get to move to longer-term housing. We don't have another space. If we do, we will try by all means to escape for or escape to that place directly. We will not gonna go to a hall whereby you will sleep uh, with uh, many people. As far as we are here, we, because it's because we don't have a choice, we don't have another places. Experts are calling South Africa's severe weather damage a wake-up call for better disaster management in the face of climate change. It shows us that we are definitely not prepared for even worse storms than what we see now. And to be clear, what climate change will do is it will shift these systems even more. So we need to be prepared for seeing what we saw on a more regular basis. So more often we will see these types of flooding. But experts say rebuilding from damage like South Africa's flooding is also an opportunity to safeguard from future extreme weather. The advice includes keeping homes and infrastructure out of floodplains, developing more precise early warning systems, and having clear evacuation plans. We need to think about restoring ecological infrastructure. So upstream, ensuring that we manage our ba basins, our water basins adequately and rightly enough so that we actually mitigate flooding. Um, we also need to think about the vulnerabilities within communities. So things like addressing poverty, um, the systemic drivers of why people are locating on these high-risk um, spaces. Many of the South African flooding victims lived in informal settlements on city outskirts with poor infrastructure. They say more public housing inside the cities would be safer, offer better access to services, and help prevent more people from ending up homeless. Linda Giftash for VOA News, Durban, South Africa. Well, now for a close look at what countries across Africa can do and should do to prepare for, respond to and recover from the effects of climate change. I'm joined now by Leslie Nblovu. He's the CEO of African Risk Capacity and joins me from Zurich in Switzerland. Leslie, welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Uh, good morning to you and thank you very much. Uh, Leslie, please give us the lay of the land here. Uh, climate change is, of course, a global problem, uh, and we always talk about the unfairness of it all, that Africa contributes the least to the problem by a long stretch, yet pays the highest price for its consequences. So what, Leslie, is the greatest risk posed by climate-related disasters to African economies today? So I, I, I agree with you entirely in terms of that. Uh, Africa is the continent that has contributed the least to climate change, but unfortunately, we are the most exposed uh, continent uh, to climate change. And uh, it's manifesting itself mainly through an increasing frequency and severity of natural disasters, uh, as you have demonstrated in your uh, earlier report, in terms of the increasing frequency and severity of floods, of droughts, and of tropical uh, uh, cyclones. These events have an extremely disruptive impact uh, on the economies of uh, African countries, as well as making it uh, difficult for communities to escape the poverty trap, to become more resilient and more, pre and more prosperous. But uh, the African Union has been working on this uh, uh, problem, and that is why uh, they set up the African Risk Capacity as a specialized agency of the uh, African Union, uh, comprising of a development agency that is working with countries in terms of uh, planning and uh, preparing uh, the response, helping African countries understand the risk that, uh, that they face vis-a-vis -vis climate change. And we also have within the ARC group uh, uh, an insurance company, uh, ARC Limited, uh, and we provide uh, insurance uh, to countries, to humanitarian agencies, as well as to small and medium-scale farmers, thereby providing the financing mechanism that allows them to more effectively uh, respond uh, to the impact of, of, of climate change. So it really takes this holistic view, this holistic approach uh, to solving uh, the climate change problem.
Uh, we always talk about how it takes a village to raise a child. I think, you know, for the future of our children here, it takes the continent to, um, to address the issues of, of, of countries across Africa. But, uh, Leslie, can you give us a bit of a picture of which African countries are the most vulnerable to climate disasters? And, and do you see efforts underway uh, to, to help these countries become better prepared for uh, future shocks? Or, or are we not seeing enough of that? Uh, uh, every African country is exposed in one way or the other to the impact of climate change because what we have uh, in, is a scenario where uh, if you look at rainfall patterns, there is too much water in some parts of the continent, whereas there is not enough uh, water in the, other, in the other parts. And then you can look at a specific case like, Mar like Madagascar, which in the last few years uh, has been really battered by several tropical cyclones, in addition to drought and to, uh, and, and to flooding. Addressing uh, the impact of climate change requires really an integrated thinking uh, approach uh, where we are better planning uh, for the impact of climate change, we are better preparing, and we are also uh, uh, better uh, responding. In terms of planning, uh, it is related to uh, how uh, we are uh, constructing our uh, buildings, how we are understanding uh, the risk exposures. And in terms of preparation, we already know uh, ahead of time that we will unfortunately uh, be exposed uh, to these risks. Sooner or later, we're going to have droughts or flooding. Therefore, the governments, uh, African governments need to be then uh, uh, better prepared in terms of having a response plan, uh, how they will tackle a disaster, and they need to put the financing uh, in place to finance the response whenever an event happens. Uh, insurance uh, plays a big role uh, in this, uh, in the sense that governments could take out an insurance policy that pays a claim in the event of uh, a natural disaster thereby providing very quick liquidity for the government to be able to uh, effectively respond uh, to, the uh, to the natural disaster. And in fact, at the African risk capacity, this is what we are advocating uh, for. And I'm happy to report that uh, currently there are 13 countries uh, on the African continent that are taking up with uh, insurance uh, uh, from us. But of course, uh, this is not the totality of the, of the continent. And I feel that African countries would be really well served to have this financing mechanism in place. I'm glad you brought up money, and I want to get to the, the financing aspect of this a little later on. But I want to ask you first, this, these historic floods we saw in Durban in South Africa, uh, more than 400 lives lost, reports of people still missing, uh, j just a, a human catastrophe. W what is your assessment of the way South Africa res responded to this and, and its preparedness for these types of prolonged periods of flooding? What, in your view, did the country do right, and what could it have done better? So whenever an event like this happens, it's always a great opportunity to learn about how to improve the effectiveness of the, uh, of the response. And I don't want to be unduly critical to African governments because they really try their best uh, in the context of limited uh, resources. Uh, what we have seen uh, in the case of South Africa is a very quick uh, response even though you know there will be some legitimate criticism that the government could have moved uh, uh, much much faster, but then if I think about what could have been done uh, differently, uh, so South Africa doesn't yet uh, participate in the insurance programs that we uh, provide that would have made uh, more funding available in a much quicker time scale, and thereby enabling uh, a much more rapid and a much more effective uh, response. Uh, African countries need to be heading in this direction where they have uh, pre-arranged financing such that whenever a disaster occurs, they're not scrambling around and trying to uh, look for the funding to respond, but they have uh, a financing mechanism such as insurance, which then uh, kicks in uh, to allow rapid release of the, uh, of, of the funding. And of course, this is all linked to 
regular scenario planning and contingency uh, uh, planning such that uh, it's quite uh, clear and very well set out uh, who exactly uh, is within the local government, within the national government, is tasked with mounting the effective response. These type of decisions shouldn't be made uh, at the time of the, of the disaster because then if they are not taken in time or the right decision is not made, then it could have massive negative consequences. Uh, Leslie, staying on the issue of disaster risk financing, uh, where should the money come from for this insurance that you're talking about? And who, in your view, in, in society, in economies, should be responsible for sharing or bearing the burden of that financing? Uh, that, that, is an, that is an excellent question. So uh, gen generally, the financing uh, can be structured in a number of, of, of ways. Uh, there is um, uh, a risk layering approach that can be adopted, meaning that for the more frequent uh, 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 events such as localized droughts or localized flooding, this can be addressed directly by the government through the provision of much better infrastructure, through setting so uh, funds aside systematically in the national budget. And then for the events that happen uh, less frequently but at a much larger scale, such as nationwide flooding or nationwide uh, uh, droughts are uh, all flooding in the very large uh, cities, as uh, you've mentioned, uh, using the example of Durban, then this risk can be transferred to insurance companies. What we do at, uh, at, at ARC is, in fact, transfer part of the risk to the global reinsurance markets. So the risk is not retained within the African continent, but is financed through a global uh, response. In terms of the payment of the uh, premiums for uh, insurance for a similar mechanism, we have uh, raised uh, funding uh, at uh, COP26 last year in Glasgow. Uh, some uh, uh, about $100 million that is available for African countries that would like to take up uh, insurance. Of course, African countries still have to pay they are part of the uh, of the expense, but there is a subsidy that is coming uh, uh, from uh, the global north uh, to subsidize their participation in the in the premium, and it is by taking advantage of schemes such as the one that I've described that African countries are going to be better financed to be able to handle some of these uh, natural disasters. And it speaks to the point that you mentioned at the beginning about climate justice. And this can be a way for Africa to be better able to cope uh, with uh, natural disasters. And we already know in advance that these disasters are only going to get worse. They're going to become more frequent and they're going to become more severe. So we really owe it to ourselves as the continent uh, to adequately prepare for this and prevent the unnecessary loss of lives and lives and livelihoods. Leslie, um, this has been extremely informative. I mean, I, I don't know how many people actually know about this idea of the insurance. And, you know, I come from a place in South Africa where people don't even want to pay insurance for their cars. But so let's keep the hope alive here that people will see the value of insurance. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here with us. That's Leslie Ndlovu from African Risk Capacity. And he joins us from Zurich, Switzerland. Thank you so much, Leslie, for your time. Thank you. Well, still ahead here on Straight Talk Africa, we'll bring you the story of communities in the Sahel who say they're fighting an invisible enemy that's driving people from their homes. VOA's Henry Wilkins is standing by in our London studios and he'll tell us more about his reporting on this story. Straight Talk Africa will be back in a moment. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. 
Welcome back. In the Sahel of West Africa, conflict between states and militants linked to Islamic State and Al-Qaeda has led to migration on an unprecedented scale. But just like the elusive terror groups that hide out in the Sahelian scrubland, there is another invisible force driving people from their homes climate change. In this documentary short, VOA flew to a town inaccessible by road and at the center of the conflict to meet those who fled and those who chose to fight the invisible enemy. Here is The Invisible Enemy, Climate Change and Migration in the Sahel, produced by Henry Wilkins. The Sahel extends almost 6,000 kilometers, 3,700 miles along the southern edge of the Sahara, from the Horn of Africa on the east to the western Atlantic coast. There's little rainfall in the Sahel, and farmers struggle to eke out a living in some of the harshest agricultural conditions on Earth. As climate change brings more intense droughts and degrades land in the Sahel, Intercommunal violence over dwindling resources has increased. Much of the conflict is between herders and farmers who vie against each other to use the land for their own purposes. Some in the region have joined terrorist groups, militants linked to Islamic State and Al-Qaeda who ride into villages on motorbikes and attack civilians indiscriminately. They wreak havoc and make parts of the region uninhabitable for civilians. While weak states and lack of development are big factors in the conflict, climate change is rarely discussed beyond the level of analysts and warnings from the UN. Unlike terrorists on motorbikes, climate change is a cause of the conflict people on the ground cannot see. But it is there. We travel to Dori in northeastern Burkina Faso, where people are living on the front line of war and climate change. We wanted to find out how the invisible enemy of climate change is affecting people's lives and driving them from their homes. But first, we had to get there. As there is a problem with insecurity on the road, we are having to use the plane to get to Dory. At the moment, we are 450 meters above the ground and we are flying at 250 kilometers per hour. Dori is the capital of Burkina Faso's war-torn Sahel province and home to thousands displaced by the conflict. The road from Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso's capital, to Dori is dangerous because of IEDs and pop-up terrorist checkpoints. Just five kilometers outside Dori, terrorists have attacked civilians and UN vehicles multiple times this year. Bagai Lamizana grew up in Burkina Faso Today, she's based in Bonn, Germany, as project officer for the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Climate change is a kind of invisible uh, enemy in the Sahel conflict. UK Ministry of Defense say that uh, um, 60 million people will migrate from degraded land, part of Africa, if nothing is done. I think neighboring countries and Europe can see this migration affecting them. Migration manifests itself in different ways in the Sahel. Some people, as farming becomes impossible, move to the cities in hope of finding work. But often they end up with low paying jobs or living in poverty. Some of those migrants in turn begin to move further afield, often to Europe. They take trafficking routes through Niger, Algeria, Libya, and then take boats across the Mediterranean. The crisis in the Sahel has displaced nearly 3.5 million people, according to the UN. We met Zara Aretta, living in a host community on the edge of Dori. She's one of the 1.3 million internally displaced people in Burkina Faso. 
Zara came to Dori from Arbinda, a town about 60 kilometers away, where extremists regularly terrorized the communities, killing men, women, and children. An attack on Arbinda in August left more than 80 people dead. She describes the raid that led her to flee Arbinda two years ago. We thought we were all going to die because they could be stray bullets. To tell you the truth, we thought it was the end of the world because of the sound of the gunshots. The children and I ran to hide in our house. We stayed there until we didn't hear any more gunshots. Then we emerged. It was terrible. There were more than 18 people who were killed in the market. I have ulcers, and sometimes if I hear a similar noise, I still remember the scene in Arbinda. The sounds of the gunfire still haunts me. I still remember the scene in Harbinda. I'm married and I have five children. Now I'm a trader and I have left stock and I'm a housewife taking care of my husband and children. In the years before she fled Arbinda, she noticed the weather starting to change. It diminished usable land and forced the community to change too. Before, it rained a lot, but now it doesn't. People ate as a family. The children respected the adults and vice versa. You had a wedding, people came and supported you. Even baptisms, people would come and support you. Zara says that tensions between herder and farmer communities have increased, shattering the unity that once existed. Salem is also a migrant who fled terrorism. Like thousands of others in Burkina Faso, he's joined a state-backed militia group known as the Volunteers for the Defense of the Homeland. They act as auxiliaries and local guides for the military, but they've also been accused of carrying out extrajudicial killings against civilians they believe are linked to terrorists. We used to have irrigation, farming and livestock. None of these things are possible now. The terrorists have left the people hungry and thirsty. Schools, health centers and government offices like the police are all closed. It is a difficult situation for us. We really need help. We don't know where they are. In the bush, sometimes we find their encampments empty. And you know they have just left. But where are they now? We don't know. You know they are coming to attack you. We can't know exactly who they are. They never faced us head on. That's the problem we have. Yeah. We live in constant fear, especially when we are on patrol. We are afraid of being ambushed. But we have hope and courage that the fight will finish soon, because we are not afraid and don't have to be. It is our fatherland.
Having lived in Burkina Faso for two years now, I've borne witness to some of the worst effects of climate change anywhere in the world. It's a big factor in this country's conflict. Step outside of Ouagadougou and into the countryside and you'll find vast numbers of internally displaced people living in extreme poverty. There are IEDs on the roadside, terrorists roam the countryside freely. The state is unable to provide security with an overstretched military and people are living in fear. It seems where people clamour for resources diminished by climate change, they go into fight or flight mode. For those who want to fight, it means joining terror groups. Those groups mostly do not have a religious ideology as their primary aim. Instead, they're financially motivated. They're looking for resources to survive. Resources that are being diminished by climate change. For others, like Salem, the effect of climate change means joining a local self-defence militia to try and fight back against the militants. But even he had to leave his hometown, just like Zara or Etta. Resources are simply becoming too scarce and it's too unsafe to stay. All of them are bound by the same thing, the enemy they cannot see, the man-made warming of the planet. Climate change contributes to conflict and conflict leads to migration on an unprecedented scale in the Sahel. Analysts say the Sahel is a prototype for what will soon start happening in other parts of the globe as climate change continues and nothing is done. But aside from the devastation, people in the Sahel want to take back control of their futures. What is the narrative of the Sahel which we could put out there? The Sahel is not only the land where it's a black doom and, and dying. It's a land of opportunities, having the two faces of the pond, not only the dark one, but also the lightened one. It's a region where you had the great kingdoms. It's a region where you have a vibrant youth. It's a region where you have a massive uh, resor natural resources. Uh, climate change is not uh, just happening in the Sahel or in Africa. It's a global issue and it's undermined health, it undermined agriculture, peace, security, unemployment, and even economy. So by bringing together and uh, intervening the political will with the action on the ground, we could really change a bit the narrative of the Sahel and give hope. I think that sooner or later there will be peace. Every time I pray to God, I pray that peace will return to this country. And that the displaced people will be able to go back to their homes. And that life will be like it was before. We pray to God that our children are able to continue our way of life. We are Burkina Bay, a fatherland of death we shall overcome. What great reporting there by Henry Wilkins. And Henry joins me now from VOA Studios in London in the United Kingdom. Henry, welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Thanks for having me. 
I just want to tell you what excellent reporting. This is a great job. And, and you know, as a visual person, I appreciate the work that's gone into this. You wrote, filmed, and produced this great piece. Tell us what motivated you to tell this story, and why did you choose the Sahel? Well, of course, there's a devastating conflict which is happening in the in the Sahel at the moment. You know, nearly three million people have been displaced by the uh, the conflict. There, thousands of people are, are being killed by the conflict that, uh, every year. Um, so, I mean, of course, that's that's really at the root of of everything. But. Uh, at the same time as this is happening, the, the coverage um, in the media of what's, what's going on in the Sahel has really been uh, minuscule by comparison to the, uh, to the size of the problem. I mean, I think since the, the Ukraine crisis has, has come along, that's, that's become even worse. So, yeah, I mean, the short answer to your question is devastating conflict and, and a real lack of, of coverage in the media. And that is why this kind of uh, reporting and journalism is so important, because your story really takes one to a place that is essentially inaccessible by road, as we learned in, in this piece, and, and of course, a, a place that is really far flung. Uh, give us some background um, about what you found. These themes around climate change, of course, violence, food insecurity, migration. How are all these issues connected? So the way they're connected is is really complex. And as a journalist, I think you know, for any journalist trying to cover climate change, um, it's it's a really really difficult story to to tell. I think it's worth noting that the uh, that climate change is just one of many many factors that are affecting the conflict in the Sahel. And I think it's fair to say that it's not the uh, the main factor. Even I mean, there there is a it's been reported that you know what's going on in the the Sahel is a uh, climate war, but I think that that's um, probably uh, an over, that's certainly an oversimplification. So, yeah, I mean, climate change is certainly compounding the conflict in, in the Sahel. I think we can definitely uh, say that. So, you know, possibly, what, arguably, what is the root sort of factor in the, uh, in the Sahel conflict is uh, conflict between herder and farmer communities. Now, climate change has a big impact on both of these communities in the Sahel because of, uh, particularly because of desert desertification, but it's also raising the, uh, the temperature of the Sahel, making rainfall uh, less and also more, more erratic as well. So all of these things affect both farmers and herder communities, and it's making uh, the, the land that they both use, or the amount of land that they, that they both use, uh, less. So that, that means that there's fewer resources to go around and it's causing conflict between the herder and and the farmer communities so uh, you know th this is just one of the things that's causing conflict between the herder and farmer communities there are big cultural differences as well and religious differences particularly the religious differences between the herder and farmer communities are what jihadist groups like isis and um and Al Qaeda are able to exploit uh, in order to, to, to kind of drive a wedge between these these communities even further than uh, uh, than has already been been done by other other factors. So it's you know it's really a complex web and, and, and a very difficult thing I think to get across. I mean the idea was that, that, that the film would kind of make some kind of uh, you know emotional connection between what's happening in terms of climate change in the Sahel and what's actually happening to the, to the people on the ground. And speaking of this emotional connection, what about you? I mean, we see people leaving their homes, uh, people that are displaced, the conflict, of course, the impact, the human impact of all of this. What was it like for you, both as a journalist and just as a human being, speaking to people who are directly affected by climate change on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's devastating, obviously. I mean, in the film, you saw some of the, uh, some of the stories, but, um, you know, I, I, I lived in Burkina Faso for, for two years, and, uh, you know, every week you're speaking to people who've, who've been displaced by the crisis, who've had relatives killed, you know, rape victims. It's just, you know, absolutely harrowing, as you can, uh, mm -hmm. as, as you can imagine. Um, but, I mean, I think one of the... One of the things to realise is, you know, the, the, these people, they're seeing the effects of climate change. They're not necessarily making the connection between it 
being something that has its origins, you know, with, with cars in, in Europe and North America or factories in, in China or, or India or, or wherever. But they are, you know, they're herders and farmers, as I say, and they live by the weather. Um, so they're, they're seeing these, uh, these, these climate changes. And of course, they're, they're obviously seeing the, the, the conflicts that I, that I just described as well. But they're, they're not necessarily making the, uh, the, the connection to, between these two uh, quite un understandably. But they are, you know, they are the ones feeling the, the, the effects of that. And it feels, um, it, it feels very, very present sort of day in, day out in the Sahel, the, the effects of climate change and, and the conflict which, uh, which it compounds. Uh, speaking of making that, that connection, when I watched this, it made me think, look, I come from a, uh, another part of the continent, of course, in South Africa, where we have seen extreme weather events, yet we tend to see these or, or treat these events as isolated incidents. You know, let's just get through this now until the next crisis. I mean, climate change is hardly a dinner table conversation. But have you noticed a change in the way people not only see but talk about climate change in the Sahel? Ordinary people... Um, leaders in government, um, community leaders, have you seen any change to that effect? I mean, uh, over the two years that I was there, I wouldn't say that I've necessarily seen any, any change. Um, but, I mean, you know, we do see, obviously, people, uh, the, the farmers and the herders, uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the changes in weather. In terms of the, of the, the, the government in Burkina Faso, where, where I was, I mean, we don't really, to be totally honest, see them talking about climate change a great deal. Again, perhaps not that unreasonably, uh, because we, you know, they, they have these very um, uh, clear and, and present problems Problems to deal with in terms of the conflict. I mean, the the the, the nation state of Burkina Faso is, you know, in a in a in a state of existential threat. So, um, you know, they they're, they're really dealing with 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 this, uh, you know, in the short term. And the uh, the, the the long term kind of um, causes of, of of why this conflict is happening are sort of something that I I think that they see as can be dealt with later, um, because there's there's obviously more to be to be done right now. That said, um, you know, there is the uh, there is the Great Green Wall project which is is led by the mm -hmm. African Union and uh, and the UN and is is spread across the uh, uh, the Sahel where they're trying to you know plant trees and uh, uh, and regenerate you know fight back the desertification that's that's happening. I mean I think that's probably the most sort of proactive um, thing that we can see uh, in terms of sort of trying to deal with, with climate change in the long term. But, yeah, as I say, in the, in the short term, I think governments in, in the Western Sahel are more focused on the, on the sort of short-term existential uh, threat. Uh, Henry, what's the greatest lesson you learned covering the story about how climate change really alters people's way of life, their families and their communities, and how it changes people's expectations of the future? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the thing that was really surprising for me, especially in terms of their, their expectations for the, for the future, was that they, you know, they really want to uh, develop the places where they, where they live. I mean, you see at the end of the, the film there, both of the, uh, of the main, main subjects in the film talk about you know, their, their hopes for the future, and they, they just want to return to the way things were. You know, they want their, their homes to be safe and, uh, and stable and have, uh, have livelihoods you know, free, uh, free from, from conflict. So I think, you know, if anything, the most surprising thing for me was just the, the steadfastness of, of the people that I interviewed and the fact that they, uh, you know, they, 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 especially I think in Europe there's this, this, this narrative that people want to, to migrate and, and to come to Europe and so on. And, you know, I mean, certainly there are some people that, that, that do end up doing that. Um, but, you know, the, the vast majority of people that I spoke to over my time in Burkina Faso aren't thinking about, like, migrating out of the country. They just want to return to, to the place where they're, they're from. I think that, that was really surprising to me.
I, I like another theme that came out of your story about, you know, when reporting on these stories, to be careful that we don't um, perpetuate a narrative of sort of black doom, but that this is also a place of opportunity um, and opportunities in terms of natural resources, um, the vibrance of young people that need to be preserved. Very, very, very briefly, we've got about a minute left. How did you see telling this story in Africa? How did you see that as part of telling the story of the of the world as far as climate change is concerned? Yeah, I mean, I think it's often said that the, uh, you know, the people least responsible for climate change are the ones who will suffer the consequences of it the, the most. And, um, you know, that was really uh, the, the point of the film for me was to, you know, the UN has, as I said in the film, the UN have said that the, the Sahel is a kind of prototype for, for the kind of things that will be happening because of climate change around the world. Um, so, yeah, I mean, really, it was just, uh, for me, making the film it was try, uh, trying to sort of ring an alarm bell and just show you know this is already happening um, there is uh, and there is this connection between what's what's happening in uh, uh, in Europe and North America and, and parts of Asia and so on which which is having a major impact on the ground in you know in this this incredibly underdeveloped and, mm. and poor nation in in Africa well Henry excellent job again let me say thank you for your time that's Henry Wilkins he's the producer of the invisible Visible enemy, climate change and migration in the Sahel. Henry, thank you for your time and thank you for joining us from London in the United Kingdom. Well, we'll continue our focus on the impact of climate change on our lives and livelihoods after the break. We'll bring you the story of a Kenyan man on a mission to restore the source of the Nairobi River. After the break, we'll show you why and what he has done to save Kenya's Ondiri wetland. We'll be back in a moment. And you're back with Straight Talk Africa here on The Voice of America. Ondiri wetland in Kenya was once a polluted dumping site, but it has now become a serene resting place and bird watching hub with clean, cool water flowing into the Nairobi River. This is the story of David Wakogi, who has led the charge for change there, and his plans for the restoration of Ondiri wetland do not stop there. Look at those herons. No, these are not herons, those are hawks. And then all oh, these are hawks, and then that's a heron flying back. They are going back to their nest. Some in Kikuyu, some I don't know where. This tree is the landmark of Kikuyu town. It's a mogumo tree, which is traditionally a sacred tree among our people, the Kikuyus. It is a very important tree that filters air. It is also connected to Ondire wetland because we have some birds. In the morning hours, they fly to Ondire, and then in the evening, this is where they have their nest the most important natural indicator of a healthy wetland is the presence of birds. I'm very passionate about wetlands because they are the kidneys of our world, the life support system.
Jason, ile ni kala. Hii ni kala, iko kwa mabati. In most parts of Africa, especially here in Kenya, many people see wetlands as wastelands that they have no value. But they forget that wetlands sequesters 30% of the atmospheric carbon. Sondire wetland covers a circumference of 3.5 kilometers. It's the biggest highland bog we have in the Republic of Kenya. It is the source of the biggest river basin we have, which is the Adi River Basin. The wetland is a very important source of water for the residents here in this area. When we began this journey in 2016, this place, nobody really wanted to look at it. If you needed to be told about a place that was fully contaminated, you only needed to look at Ondire wetland. I started by doing a lot of uh, tree planting around our community having groups uh, that uh, I worked with, especially youth groups and church groups, whereby we really planted a lot of trees. What we've done over time is that we have planted these bamboos. Their roots help in retaining soil and thus uh, prevent soil erosion. So you see, this is how this river looks like here. When we began the work in 2016, it had dried up completely. You see, now it is uh, completely uh, clean. He was talking uh, of this doing this work of flow trying flow to clean the woodly bog. Surely I thought it was impossible. Definitely, it, it would be very difficult. I knew he didn't have maybe even the resources to do some little things that he was required to do. We also do medicinal plants. This is the Mudega tree, which is a, a, an important asset in Kikuyu community. This is what we used to drink with our soup. Those people who were harvesting fodder mm -hmm. from here could burn the whole place during the dry season so that fresh vegetation could grow. Uh -huh. And what we did was to make sure that we stopped them because they tampered with the natural environment. Other people had come here saying they will clean Ondiri, and then they just disappeared. I thought he was one of them. But thank God, today, I stand here very proud of him because it has definitely changed. The biggest challenge that I have faced has been getting to convince people about the importance of this wetland. And in awareness creation is whereby you convert people from polluters to conservers. I have three uh, boys and one girl. How I bring them up, or how I teach them. And I think that is my greatest occupation in life. That is really what matters to me most. Like we wanted these children to have their own space where they can be able to enjoy themselves and uh, enjoy growing up. Because part of what one carries with him throughout his life is the childhood memories.
I conduct my campaign every day, and you know it. I know there were people you saw out campaigning earlier, and they haven't come back to the people. No, no. That's a big mistake. That's a big mistake they're making. You understand? OK, I'll keep telling them that you're still in the race. The main focus is water. I don't want to promise people I will bring them piped water. I'm promising people that I will clean their water for now. If you look at all the water companies, none of them give the water quality analysis, showing you, like, uh, this year we have given you this amount of water and it has been like this. That is something that now we must change. I'm not sure if he gets the MCA seat. He will keep taking care of Ondiri the way he has done it. I urge him to examine his conscience on whether politics will make him forget this place. Because we wouldn't want him to stop doing this work at Ondiri. Or what do you think? We want Odiri to continue being protected so that the people that have done environmental studies have someone to guide them, to know how to deal with the environment. Hi. Bado. Today we are preparing for World Wetlands Day, national event which is happening here at Ondiri Wetland. I feel so honored because this is something that we have lobbied for for many years and hoped that it would happen. And now history is being made in Kikuyu because this is the first national event that is happening here in Kikuyu. And therefore, I'm very excited. This wetland extends from the east to the west. So on this side, the northern side, that is where we have Kikuyu town, which is less than 300 meters from here. And then uh, on this side, we have a place called Ondiri. Ondiri, we call it the breadbasket of Kikuyu because there is a lot of farming activities. This place is a bird watcher's paradise. It has 76 species of birds. Part of the request that we are making that at least we have some bird watching towers. And also to leave that they hire people, maybe they contribute as they enter to walk around? Yes. Or bird watching? Yes. Uh, it, is, but you need uh, some income? What yes. The, those are the, the issues discussions. As a community organization, we couldn't be able to do enforcement. So we needed NEMA, we needed the, the county government, we needed other agencies. This is also the source of water for a place that is called Kikuyu Springs. And Kikuyu Springs is the oldest source of piped water for the city of Nairobi, which was connected in 1906. So Ondire continues to give water to Nairobi over 100 years. When our children become the leaders of this world, they will not ask us, where were you when our wetlands were being degraded? Where were you when our wetlands were disappearing? So that is the cornerstone of my conservation work. And another thing that uh, we are hoping to achieve in the days to come is to have this wetland recognized as a wetland of international importance. So far, in the Republic of Kenya, we have six wetlands of international importance, and uh, we want Ondiri wetland to be the seventh.
Kenya's wetland warrior making history there. Well, thank you so much for watching our show this week. We really appreciate your support and you watching us always. We'll see you next time. Do go well. Goodbye.